Welcome to Dr. Dayo Durban Online. We're a church family on mission to see Durban change into a place where Jesus reigns. Here's this week's message. No, great. Guys, um, thank you very much for joining us this morning. We are very excited to have you with us. We're actually at the end of a sermon series on the topic of prayer. And prayer is a very amazing subject. It's an amazing topic. It's an opportunity to speak to Jesus. And um, Jesus' disciples could have asked him anything. Teach me how to do miracles. Teach me how to do party tricks, water into wine, walk on water, all of that stuff. But they didn't go for any of those. They just asked, teach us how to pray. Teach me how to speak to the king of the universe. And um, as they've asked him this, Jesus answered them with something very famous for most of us. We all know this uh, prayer. It's called the Lord's Prayer. And we've been walking through this prayer for the past three weeks. And today we're ending off with the last little bit of this prayer. So to kick us off, I'd like to read it for us. You can follow me on the screen. Jesus replies to his disciples and he says, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And then the portion that we're going to be focusing on today, verse 13, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And there you have it, the word of the Lord and the prayer that Jesus gave his disciples to almost on a daily base um, work through and position themselves in this way. So what's very important to note, two things just quickly, once again, if you haven't joined us all this time, but firstly, that this prayer, there's no I in the prayer, there's no me in the prayer, it's always an us. Jesus wants us to think about his whole family, the whole church when we speak to the Father. It's like you're on the WhatsApp group of the family. You're not just busy with the chat with Jesus. It's not just me and Jesus. There ain't such thing as me and Jesus. It's me, Jesus, and his whole family. And sometimes we don't like the ground crew so much. We're not too excited about the family. But the reality is that Jesus sees a part of our growth, a part of our answers and our journey with him in this. And he wants us to converse and talk to him about it. The second thing that I quickly wanted to point out about this is that it's not a what you should pray, it's a how you should pray. So it's giving us a model of how to speak to God. Firstly, starting with him off with Father. I mean, the prayer starts with our. So if you were thinking family is excluded, you got it. First word of the prayer is family. Second word of the prayer is Father, um, establishing an amazing relationship. And we went through all of that in the past three weeks. If you've missed out on it, I want to invite you, go to our YouTube channel, And you can go and listen to all three of those and just catch up and be with us for today. But today we're going to dive into this last little statement, this last little request that Jesus gives us to ask the Father. And that's to lead us not into temptation, but to deliver us from evil. Now, when it comes to this, three things that I want to discuss. The first one is, big question, is Jesus saying that God leads us into temptation? with this statement. God, lead us not into temptation. Is Jesus busy making that statement? The second one is, I'm not going to tell you because you're going to have to wait after the first one is answered. And then the third one is, we'll land there. Okay, cool. So, number one, does Jesus tell us that God leads us into temptation? Meaning God is the one that tempts us and sets us up to fail I mean, it kind of sounds like this. And God, please lead us not into temptation. Um, Keep us from this. Don't let us go into that space. It's almost like as if he is the one leading us there. And here, the problem has to do with the Greek word. So today I'm going to teach you a new word, a Greek word. And the word is pronounced pirasmos. Everybody say pirasmos. (laughs) Pirasmos. So lead us not into pirasmos. And the problem with this Greek word is that it's a very full word. It means far more. We don't have one word that can be translated directly to describe what this word actually means. So this Greek word, yes, is used to translate as the word temptation or trap. So lead us not into a trap. 
may we not be tempted, keep us from this, or it's a temptation waiting for us, because when you are tempted, it is kind of something of a trap that's waiting for you. If someone tempts you, they don't tempt you to do good. Anybody ever been tempted to do good stuff? <laughs> Usually we associate the word temptation with bad stuff. No? You're tempted like that chocolate temptation, dark temptation. And then you see the nice um, uh, dark chocolate coming up and you're like, oh, and you're tempted to eat some bad sugars and a lot of it. Okay. But the word can also be used. And I think this is what's happening here. It's kind of like an intentional struggle that Jesus leave, leaves us. He wants us to meditate on this challenging topic in terms of the question whether God leads us into temptation. But the other way this word can be translated is taste or trial. So do not lead us into a time of testing, trials. In other words, this word means both temptation and taste. And in our world, when you think about the word taste, tastes can be good, depending on whether it's your math taste or <laughs> depending on what you did, how you did how you did at school. Your relationship with taste might differ. But tastes is not necessarily a bad thing. It can be a good thing as well. So in other words, what Jesus is saying here is we're praying to the Father and we're asking him to not let me go into a taste that can be a trap. Don't let my tastes become traps. Okay? Don't let my tastes become traps. That's actually what Jesus is saying. When he says, speak to the Father and ask him for the grace that as you go through tastes of life, anybody been through a taste in life before? Anybody sitting here ever in your life? Yeah, some of you, if, you, if you're saying no, you haven't lived long enough and I'll pray for you or you're just ignorant and you don't see it. So I'll pray for you also. But the reality is, is we all face them and we all go through tests. And does God lead us through a test? Coming back to the answer. Does God bring kinds, all kinds of tests our way? The answer? Absolutely yes. Yes. God does lead us into times of testing. If you don't believe me, let's quickly just look at two tests that Jesus faced while he was here on this planet. The first one is the test in the desert. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. Now, this is a moment that takes place right after Jesus was baptized. I mean, a, a dove came out of heaven. It's like the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus. There was a voice loudly speaking with a crowd standing around Jesus. And this voice said, this is my son whom I love. I'm well pleased with him. What a moment. High moment in your life. Ever met God like that before in your life? And you're like, wow, 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 amazing. The next verse right after that is, then Jesus was led by the, who? By the, okay, so who's leading Jesus? The same spirit that just publicly descended and God said, this is my son. Okay, so that spirit, the Holy Spirit, is leading Jesus into what place? The wilderness to be what? Tempted by the devil. Jesus is getting tested. He's going through a season of testing. And it's a wilderness test. That's the first time that we see. There's another test. I'm going to speak about it now. But I find it very interesting when you see the story of Jesus being tested. And we all know the story. Most of you guys, quite a famous story. Jesus get tested three times by the enemy. Firstly, I think it was to turn a stone into a bread. Second one is to jump off a temple and let God come and save him. And last one is, if you surrender to me, I will give you the power to rule over all the kingdoms on the earth. All three of them were tests. Now, what's amazing about this, Matthew is actually amazing here. He's setting us up as Jesus is the new Moses. He's the true and the better Moses. So he passed through the waters just like Moses passed through the waters. And then he goes through the 40 days of testing in the wilderness like the Israelites 40 years of testing. And Jesus faces all three of the same tests that the Israelites faced while they were in the wilderness. And then finally Jesus comes down from that test, and it says immediately after that, he went into all the towns preaching the good news of the kingdom of God that's coming. He's bringing heaven. 
He's bringing paradise. He's bringing Eden, the garden, the amazing place. He's bringing it now. The final, ultimate promise. The promised land. The true promised land. Where the Israelites, after their time of testing, struggled to take over the promised land. So Jesus is the true and better Moses. But what I find interesting is that he is being tested in a desert. I don't know about you, but I have not seen a lot of stuff in deserts. Deserts is quite spacious. Uh, it's a little bit empty. <laughs> not a lot of fruit. <laughs> uh, just a little bit. Not a lot of stuff there. It's a time of scarcity. And it's a time where you don't have much. And in that space, Jesus gets tested. And the test there was whether he would still rely on his provider being God or whether he sees a different way out. Maybe he should use his own power and provide for himself with what he sees good and what he thinks is good. Turn a stone into bread. It would be amazing. I wonder, sitting here, who of us is going through a desert season of tasting? A season where you don't have lots, where it feels like you had an abundance and now you don't. And in that season, are you running to your true provider or are you looking for other sources to get provision? I'm not happy anymore. I'm not filled with joy anymore. So I run to, and then you can name it. These things will give me joy. Those are all tests. And they can become a trap if we don't pass them. And then we get trapped in them. So the first test Jesus faced was a test of going through the desert. The other test that we read about is not the test in the desert. It's the test in the garden that he's going through. So Jesus is praying something that he's experienced personally when he's teaching his disciples. Father, lead us not into a time of testing where we can be trapped, but deliver us from the evil one. He's experienced this firsthand. And here we see the last test that he stands before. It's in the garden. And um, he goes to his disciples, verse 38, and he says, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow, the point to the point of death. I mean, what a statement. You go to your friends and you tell them, I just want to die. And I'm, I can't make it. I can't do this anymore. Stay here and keep watch with me. And then we all know they just go to sleep. And Jesus goes and he prays and he says, um, my father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. And there Jesus stands before the test in the garden. Now quickly, just hyperlink for this one, and then we're going to make it practical for our lives. But hyperlink, the first moment we read about a garden and a test, what page of the Bible? Page number one. Got it. And what's the test? Choose between good and evil or follow God's view his will, of not eating from that tree, of your knowledge of what's good and not good. What he says is good is actually good. What you think is good is actually bad. It leads to death. And Jesus in a garden, Matthew reenacts and replays that whole story again. Jesus stands before that same tree that we all face on a daily basis. We walk past that tree every day, every decision that you make. Every moment that you're standing, every challenge that you face, you're before the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And Jesus teaches us how to pass the test by saying, not my will, but your will be done. Now, in this, it might not seem like it, but in this test, I believe Jesus is being tested in a time of plenty. Have you experienced tests in time of plenty? Let me quickly set it up that you understand why I'm saying Jesus is being tested in a time of plenty. When he has, he's not, this is not a wilderness test. This is not a test where I don't have. This is a test where I have an abundance. Jesus just drove in to Jerusalem on a donkey's back and everybody wants to crown him king. I mean, he just says the word and there is going to be a revolt and an army will stand up and everybody will do whatever they want to do. For Jesus, it's going to happen. It's like he has them all in their hands. That's the way he comes in. So, I mean, he's in a very favorable, powerful position. In fact, when the guys come to arrest him that night, 
John tells us the moment they call for Jesus and he says, I am, when they ask, where's Jesus? And Jesus says, I am. Go and read it in John. It says, the whole army fell flat to the ground as if dead. Jesus just uttered the divine name. He just said the name, I am. The one that was revealed to Moses in the burning bush. And they couldn't stand in the presence of Jesus. So it's not like he didn't have the power. I mean, he is willingly surrendering his life. Nobody's taking it from him. He's giving it. And he's doing it for one reason and one reason only. Because he believes, God says, it's good. He's giving up everything. In a time of plenty, the test is, are you willing to give up the things that you hold on to that makes you significant? Quite a big test for Jesus to face. It actually reminds me of a story, true story, a guy called Irwin McManus. He's a, well, he's a creative leader um, in church, has a few businesses as well. He's, he, he, he leads a church in L.A. And before he started leading a church, actually, he ran a few businesses, fashion businesses and stuff like that and so on and so forth. And the one day he got very bad news that his business, everything that his life revolved around, just tumbled and he doesn't have it anymore. He lost it. All of the millions and millions of dollars that he had from this business is gone. He doesn't have it anymore. This was his life's work. So he goes back home. He's devastated about this. He goes and sits next to his wife. I mean, hands in his hair and his head. And he's like, I can't. I'm disappointed. I'm hopeless. And he's like, honey, I just lost my everything. To which she looked at him. She put her hands on his shoulder and she said, I thought I was your everything. <laughs> I mean, who does, who does that? Terrible. <laughs> Kick a man when he's down, you know. <laughs> and then he, he replied, well, I lost <laughs> the everything that I buy my, for my everything with and I provide for my other everything. But there is something about the things that we treasure in our life, especially in seasons of plenty, that we are sometimes tested to give up our comforts in times of plenty. Comfort kills. And God doesn't want you to be dead. He wants you to be fully alive. He wants you to enjoy the fullness of life. So, I don't know. Who is your everything? That's the taste. Jesus was willing to give up his life because the Father is his everything. And wherever the Father guides him, he says yes. Have you been tested in times of plenty? And the question is, who is your everything in that space? Okay, so answer to, does God test us? Yes, clearly. He tests us many times in seasons of deserts, and he tests us in seasons of plenty. So the question is, why would God test you? Ever thought about this? Why is God testing us? What's the gift in a taste? Well, the Bible actually gives us two reasons why God would taste us. The first one is that a taste can show us the truth. Tests reveal the truth. The truth of your character. The truth of what you actually, really, honestly believe. It shows us, it reveals to us something of what's really going on. I might say a lot of stuff 24-7 about how I believe in Jesus, and I'm giving up my life, and Jesus first, and Jesus links, and Jesus rests, and he's Allah's name, Jesus. And the next moment, I lose something that's very close and dear to me. And suddenly, I stand before a taste. And it's a big one. And it reveals what I truly believe. I mean, we see this, actually, in, in the parable of the gold bags more famously known as the parable of the tenants, where the one guy gets five gold bags, the other guy gets two, the other guy gets one. And I mean, the first verse, when Jesus starts telling this story, is all about revealing what can I entrust to you? That's the first test. What can I entrust to you? Again, it's like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. So tests, character tests, and that's many times we see Jesus doing this. God doing this with Abraham and Sarah and with well, from the very beginning, Adam and Eve. You can enjoy the garden. 
taste. Don't eat from the knowledge of good and evil. Just follow me. Who do you trust? Me or your own idea, your own desires. If you trust your desires, it leads to death. It's going to be hell. If you trust me, it leads to life. And you can enjoy heaven on earth. So tests reveal to you and to me if we're faithful and we pass it. Like he said to the master, good and faithful servant, you have been faithful with a few things. I will make you a ruler over many. First reason why God tests us is because God is looking at what he can entrust you with. How many of you guys have been praying and asking God for breakthroughs in your life? For new things to happen. You've always longed this one thing and you've been praying for it. Don't be surprised when God brings a test your way to see if he can trust you with it. If he can hand you that thing that you so deeply and so so passionately long for. So firstly, God tests us to show us the truth and see if he can entrust us. Secondly, God tests us to grow us in truth. It's the other reason why we get tested, to grow us. Test is an opportunity, actually, to bring out the best within us. That's what a good test will do. I don't know if you guys know this, um, but I go, went to go and read up about diamonds. And you would probably know this because you live in South Africa, but diamonds are made from coal. And coal that goes through under an immense amount of strain and pressure. In fact, they say when coal is pressured up to 50,000 times what we experience here on the surface, when, when it comes under that amount of pressure, something remarkable happens. If that happens and the temperature is about 1,600 degrees centigrade Celsius, which is really hot, then coals fuse into one another. The atoms, literally four at atoms connect, and out of that coal comes a diamond. That's the picture of how diamonds are formed. And whenever we go through tests or trials, many kinds, God is busy forming in you and in me the actual diamond that he created that he wanted to see there. And it's bringing out the best in us. James puts it like this. He says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. May I encourage you today that if you are being tested, if you're in a season of testing, whether it's the desert season, whether it's the plenty season, if you endure, you should be celebrating. You should be, yes, Jesus, amen. There is an opportunity here for two things to happen. For me to, to, to wrestle with the truth of where my character really is, not just where I think it is, or where I say it is. And then to allow Jesus to come and build, and build in his beauty into your life. With me? That's the opportunity here. Bringing out the diamond in the coal, or as they would say in Aladdin, the diamond in the rough. And each and every one of us sitting here, I'm seeing that with my kids on a daily basis. John comes to me at a rough day at school. Mike is at lelik gemaakt met his heart seal. For slag. And he stands before a test because he thinks of himself and speaks of himself as not worthy and not good. But God made him good. He said after he made him, he said very good, actually, when he finished making all of us. And now suddenly, because people treat you wrongly, suddenly you're not good anymore. So he stands before this journey of believing what God says, and he grows, and the diamond comes out. Okay, so 
The two reasons why we get tested is to see what we can be entrusted with. And the other one is to actually grow us, to bring out the diamond within all of us. So how do I pass the test if it comes my way? <laughs> this is quite the big one. The guys that loves getting 80%, 90% on their tests, they are listening now. Uh, Lorraine Donkey, I understand tests now. Just tell me, how do I pass this test? Jeffrey, what moet ek leer? So that ek deer kom. Hierso is die leerwerk, okay? So here is how you pass the test. Jesus actually give it to us, gives it to us in this little statement in the Lord's Prayer. He says, and lead us not into the kind of taste that will get us trapped. And here we get the answer. But deliver us from evil. This is how we pass the taste. It's in this last little portion of this request. And I want you to, just for a moment, meditate with me on this. Deliver us from evil. Now, this can literally mean two things. It can either mean deliver us from doing evil things, or it can mean deliver us from doing what the evil one wants us to do. Either way, the focus is on us doing, making a choice to do evil in the middle of a time of tasting. I don't think I need to ask for a show of hands if you've ever been there in a time of tasting to do evil. It's an easy thing. The temptation to lie, to steal, to present yourself better than what you truly are. I mean, there are so many of these. Deliver us from doing evil is the answer to passing the test. I want you to note that it does not say, deliver us from pain. But it's painful when you're in a season of tasting. Anybody been there before? When you're in a space of tasting, when you stand before difficult choices, it's not easy. And Jesus is not calling us to, del to pray unto the Father to deliver us from pain. Why? Well, because the real enemy, guys, in our journey and tests is not pain. The real enemy is evil. Can I just say that again? In your time of tasting, the real enemy is not pain. I mean, it's rough when that cold is under immense pressure and a diamond's being formed. It's painful. It's not easy. It's hot. And it's high pressure. The enemy is not pain. The enemy is evil. So I would phrase it something like this. Father, lead us not into temptation, but rather, but rather, deliver us from evil. How do you pass the test? You pass the test by saying no to evil. If you want to get on the other side of this test and enjoy the blessing that comes with the test, whether it reveals something about your character, who do you trust? Say no to doing evil. Say yes to what Jesus says. When you say no to evil, you passed the test. That's the way we escape temptation. That's the way we passed this test. How do we do it practically? Three things that I want to quickly give you. Three little lifelines. Who wants to be a millionaire? Okay. The first lifeline is phone a friend. <laughs> when you are in a time of temptation, when you are tempted, usually you are alone <laughs> in a dark place. <laughs> phone a friend. <laughs> Whenever I walk and journey with people that's going through serious struggles in life and they're struggling with temptation, I always tell them, yes, well done for coming to tell me. That's like, you got 80%. But if you want to give 100%, man, if you want to pass the test 100%, call me before whatever it is that you are tempted with. So first one is phone a friend. Second one is James chapter 5. Jesus is so clear about this. If you have failed in temptation, if you're struggling, if you have sinned in some or other way, guys, this is the only thing that you need to hear. I made a joke about it at the beginning. 
but I'm really honest with you about this. There's only one way that you can heal from temptation and the hurt of failing in it. It's by confessing, by bringing it in the light. Go and tell a friend that follows Jesus. So the point is, you go to a righteous man for the prayers of a righteous man has great power. The last one, I call it the desperate prayer. I just happened to be on Mshloti Beach. And the next moment, they, the Sports Illustrated cover photo shoot happens in front of me. They decide they're going to shoot it here today. What do I do? I pray this. Help, 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 Jesus, help. No, I mean, help me, help me. No, no, Jesus, help. <laughs> Not very theological. <laughs> Not a deep theological statement. But you know what it means? It's the prayer of running. Run from temptation. Guys, don't fight it. You're going to lose. Run from it. Like Proverbs says, don't even go down the street of lady folly. And there are some of you guys sitting here today, and you are thinking that I have a test, I know exactly what it is, as I'm speaking through this, you know exactly, it's coming up, and you're kind of like pushing it down, you don't want to work with this thing, and you're thinking to yourself, you know what, I got this, I'm going to sort it out, I'm going to walk out of here, I'm going to deal with it, and then after I think I've dealt with it, I'm going to tell one of my buddies how great God is, he delivered me from this thing. Can I tell you today, it's not going to happen. You are going to fail. You need something else than willpower to make this test and pass it. Your willpower will not be enough, and you alone are not enough to face that test. You need a different power. You need the body of Christ, the Word of God, and the Holy Spirit. Those three things you need to pass these tests. You know, willpower works like this. It's like when you go out on a boat. I'm not, I'm not a big boat guy, but some of you guys might be big boat guys. And if you're on a sailboat, the wind might take you one way, but you want to go a different way. So you stand before that rudder and you try to get it to the opposite direction or whatever it may be. And there is tension. You willing this boat to go to the different, in a different direction than the wind wants to take it. You're sitting in a point of tension Going in a different direction. That's willpower. Willpower ties you out when you try to face temptation with it. And you can hold on to it and try and go left when everything wants to go right. And then when you let it go, so goes the diet. That's willpower. And if you've ever tried to face temptation with willpower, you'll know it doesn't work. It's, it's, you need family around you. You need to run from that temptation. Listen to the voice of the Spirit when He guides you. And you need to say, Jesus, go great, go great, go great, help me. Thanks for joining us online today. As a family, we would love to meet you in person. So plan a visit to our Doxadeo Durban campus by going to doxadeo.org forward slash Durban.